All right, welcome to the Playbook Pod. This is the first uh, official intro here to the Playbook, uh, an inside look into coaches, players, and also referees. I'm Patrick Puckett. Uh, originally, I've coached for 11 years from Floyd, Radford, and Galax. And I also coach this guy right here. He's also hosting the show with me, Cliff Conley, when he's in eighth grade. And like uh, Coach Puckett said, I'm, I'm Cliff Conley. Uh, he Coach Puck was my head coach back in the day. Uh, he was my, my basketball coach in eighth grade. Um, grew up around Floyd County. Um, finished my high school career in Galax. Uh, finished my last two years there. Um, did a bunch of different sports. Um, ended up playing college basketball at Emory Henry College for two years and then transferring to um, NAIA Division II school uh, at Asbury University in, uh, right below Lexington, Kentucky. Um, so, um, you know, my, my niche was college basketball. And uh, I actually had the great opportunity of my first uh, coaching gig has been uh, an assistant at Oak Hill Academy. So, uh, you know, working alongside the great coach Steve Smith, um, seeing what he does, you know, talking with with you, uh, Coach Bucket, just uh, figuring out, um, you know, we need to we need to do something to to let people know, you know, like what's going on inside the minds of, of, you know, some some great coaches around the area. Uh, So let's talk about that a little bit. Well, you know, the thing is, I remember reaching out to you, and, you know, we both have different levels of experience. I've coached for 11 years. I also coached to Carroll, forgot to mention that, one eighth grade year as well. And, you know, coached for 11 years, and it's always fun to talk to coaches, and I don't think a lot of people actually realize what goes on behind the scenes. The coaches are actually people. And, you know, we, we talked about this back and forth, and you're coming in your first year coaching, even though you've had a lot of playing and a lot of experience that way. It's just a different dynamic, and I – you know, want to give an inside look at the people who are fans of these high school teams and, you know, maybe possibly college teams will understand how, you know, everything works, how coaches develop things and things of that nature. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. Just um, I think, you know, from the stands, you don't – I don't think you really know what, what goes on. Um, and even as a player, you know, when I was when I was on the floor, you know, I had a general idea of what, you know, what I thought they were doing um, day to day. But, um, you know, being in the coaching uh, environment is completely different. And I think that, you know, what, what our goal here is, is to sort of get people who may not have been in this realm or who, who are just asking questions, um, you know, about, you know, some great coaches or, you know, we'll hopefully we'll talk to some players and some referees that have been around, um, been around the business. And obviously we don't want to just keep this to basketball or football or one sport. We want to, you know, s- sort of get, a little bit of everything and kind of, kind of get you guys, um, you know, get you guys seeing, you know, what, what the coaching life is like, um, what the, what the college athlete or, you know, a high school athlete's life is like, and, and then a look into what I think is definitely untapped. Um, you know, what, what the referees, what, what's going through the minds <laughs> of referees. Cause sometimes, you know, as coaches, we, we always wonder, and I'm sure I, I have no doubt that fans wonder too. So uh, just, just getting in, and sort of seeing what that looks like as well. I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited to, to see what this looks like. Well, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to look at it because some of these coaches have, you know, incredible personalities. Some of them, are, you know, you, you think they're very, like, straight-laced and, you know, the, some of them will joke around all the time. You just – you don't really know them until you interview them. We're hoping to give you some kind of insight into it and, you know, all the stuff that goes on to it. We're going to have assistant coaches on here as well and, you know, explain the role and, Cliff and I will kind of talk about that a little bit because we've both been assistants and how that works. And, you know, it's just really neat to get an inside look. And it's going to be great for us because we get the opportunity to, meet, you know, meet a lot of different coaches that, you know, prior to this we probably never have a chance to and just give you insight into, you know, how it is because there is a big dynamic on how much time spent as a coach and how different it can be depending on your situation as an assistant coach where you're at and how that works and, you know, what's some of the experiences you've had so far this year, Cliff? Uh, well, I, my experience have been pretty pretty wide already. Um, you know, at, at Oak Hill Academy, we're a boarding school, so I'm, I'm around the guys, you know, pretty much 24-7. I'm sort of what, what you would call a resident manager or an RA. Um, you know, if you guys are, you know, familiar with college, you know, having, having somebody that sort of watches over the dorm. So that's what I did. Um, so, you know, even out, off the court, you know, we're dealing with uh, – with some player issues or just, you know, questions that they have. And, you know, they'll, they'll come by and, and talk with me. And um, I, I think that's – those have been my um, – the biggest things that we've dealt with is just, um, you know, 
kids want to know, you know, what can I do? Everybody, everybody wants to play, all right? If, you, if you're not, you're not on the team if you don't want to play. So everybody's always, you know, asking what can I do to play more and that, and that sort of thing. And, you know, my goal, um, you know, as, as an assistant coach this year um, was not to give them coach speak. Um, and, and coach speak for me is, um, you know, any sort of cop out that you can give to sort of stray away from the playing time, um, you know, ordeal. <laughs> Because I know, like, as a player, that's what I experienced. Um, I remember, um, you know, I, I was when I was playing college basketball, I got taken out of the game uh, one time, and I, I asked the assistant coach, I said, what what I get taken out for? Because at the time, you know, I, I thought that I could play however long. I, I was very conditioned. Obviously, I I ran cross country, and, you know, I was familiar with um, – and then at Galax, I, I never came out of the game. So I, I was used to never coming out of the game. Um, so I, I came out and I asked him, what, why am I coming out? He said, well, we just got a bunch of good players. We're trying to get them in the game. And for me, that was not a good answer. Um, so I try to do everything I can to give them an honest answer um, and, and tell them, you know, this is why you're not playing or this is why you're, you know, playing these amount of minutes. Um, here's what I would recommend you doing. Um, and we've had some guys that, that were able to – so, well, hopefully use what I was saying. And, uh, you know, I, I look at a couple of guys on our team who weren't getting great minutes um, to start the year. They came and talked with me and I gave them some ideas. And I, I think a lot of it stemmed from, you know, you, you can't show, you know, that you're, that you're frustrated. You've got to be a leader. If you're a leader on the, on the floor in practice, um, you know, you're going to be more likely to give that, that opportunity is going to come to you. And, you know, as an assistant coach myself, I know that the assistants, um, you know, they're going to have, in, in my opinion, the assistant coaches are going to have a little bit more of a relationship with the players um, than the head coaches. So if you've got someone who's willing to go to bat for you on the coaching staff, um, you know, then we're in, we're in the head coach's ear. Maybe we're going to give you that opportunity if you're showing that, you know, I, I'm going to do everything I can. And, and we've had some, some players that were able to do that. And now, um, you know, one of them is playing uh, division three. We'll be playing division three next year. Um, had no no looks the whole year, uh, but you know finally um, got some interest awesome. towards the end of the year because of you know what we were able to talk about. Another kid um, had an offer to play um, actually in in the NAI in my conference at uh, Indiana User University uh, Southeast. Um, he's actually going back home to Dubai. He's taking a gap year and he's going to play professionally um, after that. So um, just seeing that was really cool for me. Uh, you know that, that I'm trying I'm trying not to give cop out answers and. At least for the first year, it looks like it's been uh, somewhat beneficial, but but we'll find out. Obviously, you know, I'm new to this whole thing, so my, I might have gotten myself into something I didn't want to get into, but we'll, we'll figure it out as we go. Well, I mean, I, just listening to you talk about your first year coaching, I started thinking back to my first few years coaching and how much I've changed because now I've transitioned from boys to girls to coaching, and it's mm -hmm. just a, it's a different dynamic in itself, and I've changed as a person too, so it's changed – a lot of things, for example, when I coached you, I kind of look back on it and I feel bad about how I coached your team. Even though we were successful, <laughs> right. I, was, I was extremely uh, militant, I guess it would say, in some ways. I mean, I cared for you all, but, like, I demanded right. a whole lot, for, especially for an eighth-grade team at the time period when I coached you as a, a head coach. And, you know, a lot of people don't – you know, if you're a head coach of, like, an eighth-grade program, then you're assisting on the JV and varsity, and that's how it usually works. And – you know, it's changed my outlook on how I do things and some of the things I could do back then that would not fly now at all wouldn't be, you know, appropriate. And I, I, as far as condition and stuff, we were running – I can't imagine how many suicides we used to run. can't call them suicides now. But right. That's all another issue. Uh, but it's just changed so much. And, you know, as an assistant, you know, not coach speak. I mean, I think the main thing I tried to set the time for when I coached y'all was basically just set up – Hey, these are, you know, I expect everybody to hold to these standards. And if you don't hold to these standards, especially like how you act on the floor, I'm not going to keep you on the floor. And I, mm -hmm. I felt like I did a decent enough job. I even with, that for sure. yeah. with, with no matter what your skill level was, I wanted it to hold to a certain ability, but you know, it's just so much different now. I'm, you know, it just, the, the difference that you can see though in coaching from, if you do it multiple years, it really, you, you want to win every game, but it comes in peaks and valleys. You're going to have some seasons that you're going to be, you know, unreal. I think your season we won like 14 games and I lost two. And then the next season I think we won like 15 games, lost like five. And then the next year 
I win five games the whole season. So, right. so it, it's one of those things that comes in peaks and valleys. And, I, you know, throughout coaching, you know, as an assistant, it's really one of those things where you're trying to do what you can to help the whole program. It's not necessarily about you yourself. And that that's one of the harder things I found when I was younger was my ego was more driven mm-hmm. than – than where it should have been and and you've got to put your ego aside as an assistant coach and your job is to you know you can make suggestions but just realize your suggestions aren't always going to get taken exactly and and that can sometimes hurt the ego and that's it's one of those things that can happen and you know over time I've enjoyed it so much more and you know there's always positive negatives and we can talk about parents and stuff like that and that's you know that's always part of coaching and that's part of why people get out of coaching actually because there's a lot of parent involvement more parent involvement than there was to begin with and you can see that happening as well hopefully we can get the discussions that with other coaches as well and you know that's why I, I, i'm not saying we want to put them in a situation or put them in a spot or anything but it's important to hear how all these pressures come about especially when you're coaching there is a lot of pressure to be successful because there are now a lot of outside factors that once didn't exist a lot of people's you know, they want to go to college to play, whether it be basketball, football, whatever sport it might be. So the, there's a lot of parent pressure as well. There's a lot of community pressure, especially once you've developed a program that's successful, there's more pressure to keep on pushing forward and, you know, to try to show that and then show these people as human beings is going to be important because, you know, everybody I feel like changes as they coach and we're hoping to get you some inside, inside looks into that and how they are. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, we hope you guys enjoy uh, what we have for you. Um, hopefully, you've, you've gotten a little something out of what we've what we've talked about just in the, in our first you know five to ten minutes here. Uh, but hope you guys enjoy um, the playbook. And uh, if you have any any suggestions, uh, anything like that, be sure to contact us. Coach Bucket's got that contact for you. Go ahead. That uh, contact is uh, the playbook pod at gmail.com. So if you have any coaches or anything like that you would like for us to interview, now obviously don't send us in like Coach K or Roy Williams. I don't know if we can pull those off, but any like local, you know, it could be high school, it could be college coaches. We might have a few connections where we can get some interviews and anybody you're interested in us, you know, looking into, send us an email at the playbook pod at gmail.com. Yes, sir. All right. Well, uh, hope you guys enjoy. We'll, we'll talk to you soon. This is The Playbook. On today's page of The Playbook, we'll be talking to someone whose name is synonymous with high school football here in southwest Virginia and the New River Valley. Winford Beal has spent his entire 40-plus year coaching career at Floyd County High School. Stay tuned to find out just how he did it. All right, well, welcome to the playbook. Uh, today we've got our special guest, longtime head coach, uh, head football coach at Floyd County High School, Winford Beal. Coach, how you doing? Doing great this morning, Cliff. How are you? Doing, doing just fine myself. Good. So, uh, Coach, it's good to see you again. I talked with you for about seven years and uh, got to work with you for a while. So, we figured we'd get you on here. Uh, so, just tell us about yourself and how you got into coaching. Uh, you know, I guess it's been a passion ever since I was in high school of wanting to um, work with sports. Um, and, you know, the opportunities arose once I graduated from American University and I never said I, I said I would never come back to my local high school, but I ended up starting back in Floyd saying I was going to stay uh, for five years, and <laughs> I've been here for 46. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, well, that's, that's amazing. I think you, you kind of answered it. So you said you, you started, you wanted to be a coach, you know, you said in high school, you started that? Yeah, you know, i um, I owe a lot to my high school coaches, both football coaches and track coaches. And, you know, they were great mentors to me. Uh, My dad died when I was 13, so they sort of feel that um, father uh, role for me during my um, teenage years. And, you know, I'm still in touch with uh, actually my football coach, Coach Burkett. He came up to a game uh, this past fall, so, you know, still connecting with him. Wow, that's awesome. 
Um, what, what do you think have been the best parts of, of coaching? Obviously, I think mentorship has been a big, big role that, that you've played, especially uh, for me personally as a, as a former athlete of yours. Um, but what are some of the best parts, but also some of the, the hardest parts that you've had as, as a coach over here? 46 years of doing it. I'd say the um, best parts of what you just mentioned, the relationships that you develop with your players and with uh, the community and with parents and so forth, that, you know, they're uh, long lasting, you know, the wins and losses come and go and you can't totally judge success based on just winning. But if you've been able to transform a young person's life, uh, help them get an opportunity to better themselves or help them just have more confidence or realize that they have that ability. I guess the negative is, you know, you can't please everybody, no matter what you do as a coach, somebody's not going to be happy with the decision you made. You know, you either running it too much or passing it too much or whatever, you know, and uh, obviously, um, there's only one football, so you can only give it to one person. <laughs> <laughs> so, so with that, when, when you started at Floyd, and what year did you, you know, start at Floyd, and then kind of how did you decide how you wanted to build your program from that? Um, I actually started as an assistant coach in 1974-75. Uh, Believe it or not, um, I had accepted an assistant coaching position at Galax at the time. The head coach at Galax was a guy named Bill Bryant. He was there and, uh, and it recruited me sort of from resumes right out of college. And then I had a good friend, Ken Range, which was one of the assistant uh, football coaches and track coaches that sort of twisted my arm and talk, uh, talked me into changing uh, – my decision of going to Galax to Floyd. And then I, you know, I worked under uh, Buddy Shul as a head coach and uh, Dan Surface and just Jeff Eiffel and then took over in 1981. Uh, but I worked under three other head coaches before I became the head coach myself. Yeah, that's awesome. So when you took over in 81, how did you figure out how you were going to build the program and how you were going to get your players to buy in? Uh, it was difficult. I mean, when I say difficult, uh, Floyd had had its best year ever the year before. You know, Coach Heifel uh, took an 0-10 team in 1979 to an 8-4 team uh, in 1980. It was the first time Floyd had been in the football playoffs for – a long, long time, and he accepted a job at William Byrd in Roanoke, and I was sort of his main assistant and was uh, able to uh, take over for him. So, you know, I had to convince the, not only the players but the community that we wanted to uh, carry on what he had gotten started, but also to put my own spin on it. You know, you can't totally replicate anybody else. You have to put your own spin on things that you're doing, and uh, – you know, we, we um, had some good seasons, and then in the third year, sort of things took off, and, you know, we had a, you know, a long run into the playoffs during that time. That's, I mean, that's awesome to have, you know, to coach for this many years and still be doing it. It's just incredible. And, you know, one of the toughest things I always do is try to figure out, we both coach basketball, so we don't coach football, and so you have a lot larger roster, and, so how do you figure out which players, you know, what positions they fit best in? And I know sometimes they're playing offense and defense, especially in a smaller school division. So, Yeah, for us, you know, the majority of our kids do play on both sides of the ball. And we've been lucky with Floyd being just uh, not having middle school, that the eighth graders are there right in the building where we're at and they're able to lift with us. So we get to know – their abilities and talents early, and that helps somewhat. And then, again, we have been able to sort of adjust and adapt to fit our offense to the players we've got and the players to the positions that fit their natural given abilities. You know, obviously, uh, we tell our kids, and I'm sure you guys appreciate it, you know, no matter what type of offense you run, you got to have five offensive linemen. <laughs> <laughs> that's the key to success in football, you know. You know, it doesn't matter if you run the single wing or the 
air raid or spread or whatever. You got to have those five guys up front. That's the key to success in football. So had and you were talking about all those different, uh, you know, styles of play. Has that changed for you, um, you know, year to year, or, or how do you how do you gauge, uh, you know, if you're going to change or do you change year to year? Yeah, we we have changed over the years. You know, I think you do have to have a system in place, but when you can't go out and necessarily recruit kids, you have to sort of a gear your offense and your defense to the people you've got. And, you know, when I first started, you know, it was more of just old school football. Uh, everybody was in the I formation, uh, tight ends. And uh, throughout the years, we've been lucky to have some uh, pretty good quarterbacks and receivers. So we've had to adjust to a little bit more wide open spread type look as well as uh, now we sort of have a blend of both. We'll, we'll still get into the I some, but we're still more of a, pistol, gun, one back type offense, just because that's the type of personnel we've got right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we sort of stay more of a 40 or even front defense over the years. That makes sense. Um, what about, what about your practice structure? How, has that, um, has that changed or do you, have you, have you stayed with a similar um, routine day to day for that as well? Somewhat of a similar routine, I guess probably you learn, from experiences that more is not always better. So, you know, throughout the years, we've actually spent a lot less time on the actual game, a practice field, but more time with school sessions, more time with film, uh, uh, that type of thing, you know. Uh, you know, when I first started, you know, we'd practice two or three hours. Now it's more just pretty close to just about a two hour practice, mm -hmm. you know, that if you can't get it done and that time, you know, you're going to lose the kids. And we try to use small segments, five to ten minute segments. We don't want to go too long on any one particular thing. Well, following up kind of on that with, like, practices and stuff like that, with coaches where you have so many more players than, you know, basketball team, you just 12, maybe 14 maximum. How important are your, your coaches to you? And what do you look for in your coaches and coordinators? Um. That's another area where I've been very blessed from the very beginning up until now to have a lot of great assistant coaches working for me. And um, we don't try to micromanage our assistant coaches. You know, everybody has the same general plan or approach of what we want to get accomplished on each particular practice or each particular game. But they, they run the show. You know, they do the drills that meet the needs of their position or – work on corrections that they may need to make and so forth. But I'm definitely not a micromanager and I uh, learned this early. It's better to hire people smarter than you than dumber than you. <laughs> they make you look <laughs> Well, with, you mentioned game preparation and, you know, I, I don't really feel like, I know basketball, I know people don't understand football. I have no idea myself. I can't imagine how much game preparation is involved you know, before each game, you have one game for a whole week, and how do you game plan for that? Uh, it pretty much starts Friday night after uh, that week's game, you know. The luck, good thing now is with huddle and the availability of video and all of that makes it very easy, but, you know, each coach individually breaks down our game film when they get home that night, and then – you know, we start on the opponent's uh, tendencies, and there's so many programs within Huddle that makes it easy. You know, we're just punching in the numbers and it gets us a good idea of what they do on different situations, down and distance, formations, et cetera. But um, we work Saturday individually, and then we always meet Sunday afternoons. And that's another thing that has changed a little bit. We used to meet forever on Sundays, you know four or five hour meetings and we found that was just not a very good use of time. So now basically we sort of know what we're going to do when we get there. And then it's just a matter of coming to a consensus and it's limited to about a two hour meeting now on Sundays. Cause you know, our assistants have children and have a life as well. So <laughs> I have to give them uh, that opportunity. So uh, as far as uh, another question, it's like a typical day during your season and, how things work from 
you know, from game plan or certain teams harder to game plan for because of certain offenses they run and things like that? Oh, yeah. When you get uh, some of the non-traditional things, of course, you guys know we play Giles, which is a single wing team that you don't see but once a year. And it's hard for your scout teams to replicate what they're doing. So, you know, you try to, in the summer practices, you know, have a little session just to go over some of their things each week, you know, so that you can't rely on just that one week of trying to adjust and adapt to what they're doing. And, uh, you know, scout players, well, I'm sure in basketball as well, you know, they're, they're so important to what you're doing and what you're trying to get accomplished. Absolutely. Um, well, you've been doing this for a long, long time, um, longer than I even imagined, to be honest. Uh, had no idea it was 46 years. Um, so throughout that time, was there – I mean, there might may have been more than one time. But was there an instance where you might have thought, you know, I, I'm done, this is it? Um, and how did you find a way to get past that? What, what was your drive that you found, to, I mean, to do this for as long as you've been doing it? You're right, you know, so especially – some of those seasons that don't always go the way they were expected to go, you know, the, sort of the seasons that didn't achieve or underachieved. And, you know, you end, you put so much of your time and energy into it along with um, the other coaches and players that are involved that you said, man, this, you know, this is just not working. But, you know, then again, after a week or so and reflections and, uh, consult other coaches. I mean, I, I rely a lot on my peers. You know, I don't hesitate to pick up and call some of my associate coaches that are in the area or even far away. And, you know, we just sort of talk through things. So it's just more of a just um, mind healed, healing over a, a rough season and realizing, do you still love the game? You know, do you still love kids? If you still love the game, you still love the kids, you know, you need to keep on going until you feel like you're not really being effective or not making positive changes and so forth. So you know, as of now, I feel lucky that I have a love for kids and the love for the game of football. So I don't know if you were going there, Cliff, I'll go right I here. You're good. Uh, so what you mentioned other coaches, what's something uh, you've learned from other coaches or something you always – or, you know, or someone you coached against or someone you coached with that you'll – you know, you've always used or something like that? You know, some of the little things I'll never forget. Um, you know, you guys know him, Coach Norman Lindenberg, legendary football coach at Radford. When I first started in 1974 as an assistant, and he didn't know me from Adam – you know, when we first played him, he comes out and introduces himself, and here's a guy that's won state championships the previous years and just really make, made me feel special and just told me then, you know, this is, a, this is a fraternity. You know, coaching's a fraternity, and we all have to help each other out. And if you need anything, I'll always be around. So from that point, he was one of the first people I called when I first got the job and still call him to this day, even though he's not coaching, as well as – many others and you know they don't really tell you what to do but just so that they can share what's worked for them and what did not work for them and, uh, you know you know they give you just some options to how to maybe approach things but you know most people that give you advice don't really want to tell you exactly what to do but just to sort of lead you in a direction of how you maybe should want to do it yeah i i you know, in my short time as a coach and, you know, as a player, um, you know, I, I've seen, you know, you were, you were talking about Coach Lindenberg, and I think that a lot of coaches' success, especially, you know, the the ones that are, you know, have, have won those championships, done those sorts of things. I look at Coach Smith here at, at Oak Hill, um, and I think what makes them, you know, special is that if you were to go up and talk with them, you would have – that that wouldn't be something that, you know, you would think, um, you know, as a – first impression they, they're very personable and I think you know obviously I think the same thing thing of you um so I, I guess you know and I think that's part of your success as a coach um too but you know from your standpoint what do you think has led to your success um throughout these years uh for you being a head coach 
I think a lot of it is um, trying to develop a positive relationship first with your administration, your community, uh, hiring good assistant coaches, you know, that, you know, you can't do it all by yourself. And then just uh, trying to judge players' ability, put the player in the best position to have the most success they can, and then the team will have success. And uh, not so always, you know, all of us in this conversation, you know, we love winning, but you, you don't want winning to be the all in all goal of what you're doing. You know, you're transforming lives, you're educating and teaching young men. Uh, I feel like they know they can trust me. They know that I'm going to be honest with them, uh, that I'm going to uh, treat them fairly, not always equally, but we're going to treat them fairly. And I think that's what young people are looking for. And sometimes, you know, in today's world, especially in the last five to 10 years, you know, kids, a lot of kids still need that tough love as well. They don't get it at home and they need somebody that's just going to have to do that at times also. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely agree. Um, that's, that's been an experience that I've had too, um, especially with, uh, you know, Mark Dixon. Um, I think that he, you know, he, he definitely replicates uh, what you're talking about there too. Um, and we actually had, we had Glenn Burnett on the, on the podcast um, last time and he mentioned he was talking about, you know, it's really hard nowadays for coaches to stay in one spot um, for a long period of time. And I'm interested to hear, you know, your, your take on, you know, how have you been able to do that your whole career? You've been, you've been at Floyd County high school and not, not a lot of people can say that, especially with, with the tenure that you've got there. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm definitely uh, the exception to the rule. You won't find hardly many coaches that stay at one school and one community for their entire coaching career. And I think there are positives as well as negatives to that, you know, uh, Throughout the years, you know, again, I've had some opportunities to leave and, um, you know, always, you know, you debated in your mind the pluses and negatives and then, uh, you know, something just keeps telling me to keep doing what I'm doing. I guess it's just because I still enjoyed being here and, I'm, you know, I've had not a perfect relationship with all administrators, but for the most part, you know, they've been good to me, you know, I don't. I think no coach is totally happy. We always want a little bit more. <laughs> so we don't ever get all that we really want or feel like we deserve. But I think I've overall been treated fairly. You know, that's from the top down, you know, our superintendents and school boards and so forth. And um, both of you have been in Floyd, you know, with uh, Patrick coaching and you playing here, that for the most part, the kids are coachable. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, sometimes uh, – as always, you have to tweak some things, but we, we've had pretty, you know, not a lot of negativity in terms of just working with people. So I guess it's just a relationship thing with people that's kept me here. Well, kind of following up on that, you know, you've coached for a long period of time and, you know, every team, I know you would love every one of the teams you've ever coached, but what makes certain teams just a little more special than other teams that you've coached? I think you you guys would agree it's a chemistry. You know, some of them – I mean, you got to have the talent. You know, when you have great athletes, it's not because of great coaching, you know, and some of the great teams we've had are because we've had some outstanding athletes, but they're also outstanding people, and they just had that great chemistry that uh, were willing to sacrifice for the team and not a lot of big egos and – played well and they, uh, you know, I'm sure Cliff can relate, you know, they played together for long periods of time, you know, usually you get a group that sticks together and plays together through eight, from the eight or ninth grade on through, they, they build some pretty strong bonds that are hard to break and, uh, you know, it's hard for them to let their buddy down, you know, but, you know, each player uh, feels an obligation to the other players and coaches and so forth, but, by far, other than, you know, just athletic ability, I think it's the chemistry that keeps uh, the more successful teams at the top. Now, now the next question with you, it's an incredible question, is, 
you know, what's changed since you started coaching? Because there's probably been quite a few changes you've seen over this period of time. Oh, yeah. Um, I guess the first and foremost thing is sort of like what we're doing now, technology. You know, technology has just made such an impact on all sports and football in particular. When I first started coaching, you know, we were videoing off of 16 millimeter cameras. We had to take the film to run up to get it developed and then wait and then go back and pick it up and all of that process. And then when the VHS tapes came out, we thought that was the greatest thing since white bread, you know, it's like, you know, now they're obsolete and then the uh, DVDs and now of course everything is just all on the net and the huddle systems and so forth. So technology, I think, uh, facilities and weight rooms and uh, just, you know, field turf, you know, all of the uh, things that are now available, not just to a few schools, but to a lot of schools. But, you know, when I first started at Floyd, we were basically uh, lifting weights in a little storage closet, you know, it took <laughs> a long time to get to the present weight room that we have. I think it was like 1998. Of course, now we tried to upgrade it over the last few years, but, you know, between the technology and the facilities, I think are probably the major changes. Have, have the kids changed? That's the question, because from the time period I've coached, it, certain things are different a little bit, I think, but you've had a longer tenure than I have, so. Yeah, I think in a sense they have, in the sense that, like you said, the technology's changed them, you know, that, when I first started, you know, it wasn't a whole lot of video games and kids staying inside 24-7. You know, most of the kids are always outdoors doing something. Obviously, in a rural place, you know, they're working on farms, whatever. But, you know, um, kids, uh, you know, gotten addicted to, you know, those type of things. And I think – they don't study the game like they used to. I mean, they have it available, but, you know, they don't watch a college game or a pro game to understand the nuances of the game. They just watch the game. But I think, you know, we had some generations that would just really watch their position, watch the uh, specialties of their positions in a game. So, and obviously I think Parents have changed, you know, I think parents have entitled a lot of their kids. A lot of kids now come to school, whether they're just students or athletes, feel entitled just because of where they went or who they are. So, you know, you know, you didn't get a whole lot of that when I first started. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to ask a, a follow up question too. you know, that change. I think it brought it, this brought it up um, when I was watching uh, the last dance. There was, a, you know, the big 10 part series with uh, talking about Michael Jordan. And I think what really shocked me that I didn't ever realize was that, you know, at a certain point he decided to start lifting weights. And, and for me, I thought, well, I just thought that was a given, um, you know, that, you know, strength and conditioning was, was always something that, that was, that was done. So I'm interested to hear um, from the football perspective, you know, how has, you know, the strength and conditioning program, your lifting program, how has that changed? Um, from before till now? Oh, tremendously, Cliff. It's been an ongoing thing. And as a coach, you really have to take the time to go to uh, strength conditioning clinics to study the good strength coaches. Uh, the science of it has evolved so much from, you know, 1970s until now. And just, you know, I've seen so many different philosophies that were good then that are sort of not the best philosophies now, but uh, it's the key, I believe, to success in any sports. And I was like you, I was just amazed that, you know, when, you know, Michael said, you know, to win this thing, we got to go back and uh, get in the weight room. But, you know, and it's, it's a plethora of things. It's uh, the injury prevention thing and just it not only makes you physically tough, but it also makes you mentally tough. And, uh, you know, I don't think, you know, it's a sport that it, it doesn't help. You know, you, you read the Tiger Woods and how he's such a big uh, weight room guy. And, you know, just uh, every sport now, it's, it's the key. 
I, I agree. Um, and I, I've experienced that, you know, firsthand, you know, obviously playing for you and, and going into Galax and, you know, having, having experience with coach Dixon. And then obviously when you get into the, to the, you know, the college arena too, um, I think there's even an even more emphasis on injury prevention once you get into the, once you get to that level as well. Um, from your standpoint, again, do you have any, uh, any sort of favorite memories that you've had as a coach? It doesn't have to be a favorite game. It can, but um, I'm just interested to hear, you know, if you've got some favorite things that you always remember um, from your coaching years. Oh, yeah. You know, obviously, you know, you, you remember a lot of the uh, opportunities that you get once you do get into the playoffs. And we've been lucky to play in a lot of really close playoff games. Um, you know, one that comes to mind is, is uh, back in 2001, you know, we had to play uh, Gate City at Gate City um, in the uh, 2001 state semifinals. And everybody told us, you know, you don't have a chance. Nobody ever beats Gate City at Gate City. <laughs> uh, you know, it's football capital of Southwest Virginia. And when I get off the bus going down there, they say, well, this is, uh, Deputy Sheriff's going to be your escort for the day. <laughs> so, you know, it's important that you know, your high school coach is being escorted by a Deputy Sheriff. But anyhow, we sort of, you know, beat them 17 to 3 and still <laughs> shocked them as well as a lot of the people down that way. And it's it's a, a plethora of them. And then, you know, the heartbreaking loss is probably the toughest loss that I've had was a playoff game against. Um, George Whiff in 2002 regional championship game. We were 11 and 0 and had only given up 60 points. It was a very windy day, and they ended up beating us 21 to 16 and went on to win the state championship that year. It was probably, that 2002 team was probably the best team that we've had that doesn't get a whole lot of uh, recognition. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, like, funny stories that you'll always remember, just something that just happened that you, you know, <laughs> makes you laugh or whatever it might be? Uh, probably from my first year, I had an assistant coach uh, that um, I was ranting and raving on uh, the sidelines, and I turned over and said, what the H is going on out there? And he says, <laughs> You're the head coach, don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> I learned real early that, you know, the man in charge better know exactly everything. You know, you know I was saying, what in the hell is going on? <laughs> You're the head coach, don't you know? <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's pretty good. That's uh, good so well, now we're getting toward the end kind of uh, what's something that, you know, people don't know about you? Uh, you know, they probably know quite a bit about me, but, you know, I like, <laughs> like getting out and, uh, with friends and playing cards and a little poker and just, you know, enjoying life, you know, not the 24-7, uh, always working football and uh, do a lot of uh, traveling with friends. Uh, you guys know the Joneses, uh, Dave Jones and his wife. We uh, try to take an annual trip down into the Caribbean each year and do a lot of the island type deal and sailing and that type of stuff, you know. I'm, you still singing happy, sorry, Cliff. Hey, you're good, go ahead. Uh, you still singing happy birthday to all the students every single day like you once did when I was there. Still try to do that, you know. <laughs> they used to this growly old voice, the, the bass happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> That's good stuff. Um, I had a I had a question for you about um, you know something that people may not know about you. I know uh, obviously you graduated from American University, but you were a track guy over there, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, yeah um, that so was the uh, main reason that I went to American University. To be honest with you, as a senior in high school, I didn't have a whole lot of idea of what American University was, where it was at. But the track coach uh, contacted me, and they had a really good sprinter there. So we're looking to get some more sprinters to put together a relay team. And um, so I was sort of offered a partial track academic scholarship. And uh, just out of the blue, that wasn't my first choice, but went there. And uh, actually, some we still hold some of the records, uh, <laughs> school records there, you know, the pen, you know, 
participate in a lot of really big track meets, you know, pin relays, things like that. But it was a great experience, you Noah. Know? It was all, also a tumultuous experiment, experience. Uh, you know, I was in D.C. doing all the Vietnam War protests. So there was a lot going on. And I was also, uh, show you how old I am, I was also a pre uh, Subway or pre metro, they were just finishing up the metro. When I was <laughs> these days, so. Wow, the whole city was tore up when I was there. Are you uh still beating coaches and players in the shuttle run? Huh? Are you still beating coaches and players in the shuttle run when you used to, you know, they used to challenge you? I remember, and you used to have to show those them. days are about gone now. <laughs> My hamstrings. <laughs> That's pretty good. Well, we've got uh, we've got one more question for you, Coach, um, and I, I'm interested to hear uh, your take on this. I'd actually like to know uh, where you got this question. Are you a man or a mouse, Coach? I'm a man. <laughs> <laughs> where did where did you get that from? I'm, I've heard it so many times. Uh, I, the, the exact source I don't know, but you know when I was. It first started in the 80s, I read it in a book or somewhere. Uh, but I don't, to be honest with you, I really don't know the source of where <laughs> that um, originally came from, you know. That's good. I don't think, um, I'm sure it's out there somewhere, but it just <laughs> sunk in and I've been saying it and still saying it forever. <laughs> that's good stuff. Well, that's, that's about all we got, right, Coach? That's that's it right there. All right. Well, uh, Coach, I, we we appreciate having you on. Thank you uh, for taking some time out of your day. Um, I know I speak for uh, pretty much everybody um, who'd be listening or watching or whatever. Um, we have a great respect for you. We appreciate um, all the time you've devoted to uh, the game of football and you know kids like myself. So uh, we have great respect for you and really appreciate everything you've done, Coach. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. We appreciate you. Well, thank you guys for. Uh giving me the opportunity to talk to you. And it's been an honor for me too. You know, it's always good being around good people. <laughs> you guys are two of the best and I appreciate you. All right, thank you, Coach. Yes, sir.